last blood that he would ever and that had paid the price for our sins, full atonement, paid in full for the sins of mankind, free to choose. And should you accept today through open heart, through contrition, repentance, by faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles up, if you will, this morning. Uh, we're, I'm going to bring a message today, if you will, titled, When Christ Comes to Down. And this is part one of four for the month of March. We're going to be in Mark chapter two, as we have already read today. And the idea here is that what impact and what happens when Jesus Christ comes to town or when Jesus Christ comes by, when he comes into your life, when he comes into your days. And in Mark chapter 2, and again, like I said in the onset in our reading this morning, in Mark chapter 2, I've preached from this passage of Scripture uh, all over the place a multitude of times. Uh, the, the margin of my notes has more uh, chicken scratch. I go ahead and call it what it is because my handwriting's so bad. Uh, but there's a multitude of different points and, 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 and messages just in the margin of my Bible because uh, this is a very powerful portion of Scripture. But I do feel that as if we, it would benefit us here today for the dire need that not only our community has, a community uh, under the shroud of darkness and despair, but our church as well to invoke and provoke each one of us to be a witness and a light, the light of the glorious gospel in the lives of men, women, and children. Mark chapter 2 and verse 1 says, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. Straightway many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive him, no, not, uh, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Father, we ask of you now to please hear our prayers, Lord, and look upon our needs. Lord, we pray you look upon the needs of our community, of our village, Father, of our area right here, dear God. And I pray, dear Lord in heaven, that you would send the Holy Spirit by, dear God, that you would continue to provoke us to be a witness, to be a light unto the lost in our area right here, dear God, that people may come to know you, Lord, or at the very least, people may uh, get the opportunity to hear the precious gospel, that you may lay it upon the threshold of their heart, Father, that they would have to make that choice, that they would have to either be overcome or overcome themselves, the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the dire need of the salvation because of their sins. Lord, we love you and we thank you. Bless us now this time together in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now in the second chapter of the book of Mark, Mark states that Jesus Christ again enters into Capernaum. And I, I like this. Uh, I like how John Mark is uh, used of the Holy Spirit of God here to write. Because he makes sure, he doesn't just say that he entered into Capernaum. He says he entered again. And again, he entered into Capernaum. And we find that he is coming another time, a second time, if you will. And in Mark chapter 1, verse 21, the Bible says, And, and, when, uh, and, and they went into Capernaum, and straightway, straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. So they were there before, guys. It was, it was there where multitudes would hear Jesus Christ preach. Souls would be saved. Bodies would be healed. It, it, was, it, it, was, uh, it was here uh, that they were amazed at the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And we know that according to Mark 1, verse 28, saying that his fame was spread abroad throughout all the region. They were blown away by the authority that Jesus Christ spake the first time he came into Capernaum. Now, he would enter into the synagogue. He would preach the word of God. He would walk next door to Peter, Peter's mother-in-law's house for lunch, and she was sick, and then he healed her. We read that in chapter 1, verses 30 through 31. And then he geared up for an evening service in the 32nd verse of chapter 1, and the Bible says, just clearly put, that it was packed. And oh, what a service it would have been. Beloved, the house was packed out according to verse 33. The Bible says that all the city was gathered together at the door, and Christ would preach words seemingly never heard before with such veracity, with such fervor, preaching with authority. The sick would be healed, the deaf would hear, the dumb would speak, the blind would see, and the lame would walk. People were doing things they had, were never able to do before. And why? Because Jesus Christ came to town. 
Luke chapter 4 and verse 18 from the screen says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. Verse 19 says, to preach the acceptable year of our Lord. My friend, we find throughout the Word of God, we find throughout the Bible that, that when Jesus Christ shows up, when he comes to town, when he makes his way into your life, you're going to be able to do things that you've never been able to do before. I want to give you an example this morning as we tie this into Mark chapter 2. We are going to come back to Mark chapter 2. But it, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, and, and, a, and a few more down. It is so familiar that we, we, if we're not careful, we allow the familiarity of the Scripture to overshadow the impact that it has. I understand that preaching from a particular portion of Scripture a multitude of times, people are like, oh, well, I remember that when you preached that before, and I remember this topic and that topic and in the youth service and all this and that, and I understand that fully. I get that. However, as Pastor Ellis always taught us, review makes us better. Review, review, review helps us learn. So we see in Revelation chapter 3 that the church of the Laodiceans, Christ said unto them, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. So what we find from our three portions of Scripture we've looked at thus far this morning, Revelation chapter 3, Luke 4, and Mark chapter, of course, 1 and 2, but Mark chapter 2 where we're going to settle this morning, is that there is a correlation with a miserable, correlation with being a, a sick, correlation with, with this sickness and with the palsy and with all these things that are happening that we find here, that God is using them as a spiritual connection in a person's life, not just a physical connection. The group of the, the Laodiceans were a group of people who thought they were set. They, were on, they thought they were on their way to heaven. They were increased with goods. They were in need of nothing. And the Lord rebukes them. He rebukes them in love by, number one, calling them wretched. The word is only in the Bible twice, in Revelation chapter 3, and then it's found in Romans 7, verse 24 on the screen. O oh, wretched man that I am, Paul says, who shall deliver me from this body of this death? Paul is referring to his flesh, the dying sinful part of mankind, which is, which is not regenerated. He says, this is wretched. Jesus Christ says that the Laodiceans are wretched, and he's, he's tying this together in their life. Number two, he calls them miserable. This word occurs only twice in the New Testament, three total in all the Bible. Revelation 3, and then from the screen, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. That's on the backside of giving an illustration of saying, if Jesus Christ has not risen from the dead. Paul says, if he has not risen from the dead, and that's the only hope we have in this life, we are of all men most miserable. But we know Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. What is he saying here? wretched that unregenerated part of the body it's dead paul calls it a body of death miserable hey if, if we have not salvation if jesus christ is not the only way to salvation and that's who and what we're hoping in we are of all men just miserable amen blind he calls them the word blind occurs 82 times in the bible and it simply means to be without sight but the lord but the way the lord is speaking uh, uh, he's the same way he sp he's speaking of the of the laodiceans is the same way he spoke unto the pharisees in luke 6:39 saying can the blind lead the blind shall they not both fall into the ditch he calls these laodiceans naked naked and it's speaking of a heavenly garment, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, if so, be, uh, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Uh, being found naked, guys, is also a term that we use as being exposed, if you will. Luke 14, verse 13 says, But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, call the maimed, the lame, and the blind, Jesus Christ tells us. All of these are references, guys, to a lost soul a soul destitute of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why you find the Lord in Revelation 3 will spew these Laodiceans out of their mouth. 
He will spew him out. You say, wait a second, uh, what's inside of his body? Why is he spewing them out of the mouth? Do you know what you regurgitate to? You, you regurgitate something that is a foreign substance, something that does not belong in your body. That's why alcoholic, alcohols and, and drunkards, that's why they're trying to get the poison out of their body. That's why they regurgitate it. When something gets in your stomach that doesn't belong there, you regurgitate that. And in Revelation chapter 3, the Lord is speaking to these Laodiceans who are in the church building, okay? And yet, they are lost. They are miserable. They're naked. They're poor. They're blind. They are a lost soul. And therefore, the Lord says, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth, out of that church. But this is what... And you find packing into the place in Capernaum. People with physical and spiritual ailments. People who needed help, my friend. Just like many of us here today, and many, and many if not the majority of all that are surrounding us in our community today, in our villages, in our towns, in our cities, throughout all of our country today, people who are, have spiritual ailments that are in need of help. Each one of us were once in this life wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. It doesn't, how much, how, it doesn't matter how much money you've ever had. It doesn't matter how nice you've dressed. It doesn't matter how much education you've had. It doesn't matter who your family is. You were lost. If you're, not, if you're not saved today, you are here wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And if you are saved today, there was a time in your life when you were poor, wretched, miserable, blind, and naked. Because without Jesus Christ... That is exactly what you would be. When Jesus Christ came to town, when Jesus Christ came to Capernaum, guess what? They got in, amen. They got clothed. They got sight. They got, hey, listen, uh, they, they became unmiserable. They became unwretched. Uh, they could see. They could hear. They could speak. They could they receive something that made a difference in their life. Mark chapter 1, verse 33 tells us that all the city came and were gathered at the door. Now, guys, I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now. I am a Bible believer to a fault. I'm a Bible believer to the hilt. And if you're not a Bible believer, you're wrong. Amen? And I'm not saying it's my way or the highway, but it's God's way or the highway. It's his word or the wrong way. Amen? Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So when Jesus Christ came to town, the Bible says, all the city was gathered at the door. Guess how many that means? That means every soul inside Capernaum were gathered at that building that day. Amen. There wasn't a soul anywhere else. There wasn't anybody off watching the rugby. They wasn't sat over here at the pub. They wasn't acting a fool over here. Everybody in that entire city were gathered right there where Jesus Christ was. Amen. All the city were gathered at the door. Jesus got up while it was yet night. Found a place to get alone and pray. And then we find in Mark chapter 1, verse 38. Look in your scripture there. In verse, verse 38, it says, And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, for therefore came I forth. Jesus Christ preached the truth to every single soul in Capernaum, and thousands got saved, and thousands got healed, and all these things. And afterward, Jesus Christ said, let's go find a place to pray. And after he had prayed and received strength, he said, listen, let's go to the next town, and let's do it again. Amen. Praise God. He goes, listen, let me go to the next town. Let's do the same thing again. Jesus Christ knows, and he knew of the power of preaching. Amen. And if we think today that there's a power in a community center in these church builds today, you are fooling yourself. Amen. We find churches in our community right in here. Oh, they're so busy. They got so many people coming in because they got every single thing that's going on in the community. But they ain't got Jesus Christ. Do you understand? You can run every computer course and every square dancing class, and you can run every CPR, everything that you want to. But if the gospel is not preached one way, shape, form, or fashion, souls are not getting saved, and you are not a church. Mark it down tonight. Amen. Jesus Christ said, let's go pray. And then he said, let's go to the next town. Let's do it again. When Jesus Christ comes to town, something big happens. When Jesus Christ comes to town, Something massive happens. When Jesus Christ moves into your life, changes occur. We were talking about just before church here about how easy it is once you get out of church to get back in. 
You grow, you develop these habits in your life and you get conditioned and comforted and into doing your own thing on church days and church times and, and how difficult it is to get back in there. And I understand there are certain things that impedes us to come and be in church. There's certain things like sickness and, and being vulnerable and the things that are going, I get all that. I'm not speaking about that today. But the one that is healthy, wealthy, and wise and knows they belong, they could be in church and you're somewhere else, I'm telling you, you're going to develop a habit of not being there and churches are going to become an inconvenience to you is rather than something that should be an importance to you. Amen. So here he comes again. He says, you know what? Let's go to the other towns and let's do the same thing. Let's go preach the gospel somewhere. Amen. Let's go make a difference in, in eternity for souls of men, women, and children. Amen. And that's what Jesus Christ does. And all of a sudden, he says, let's go back to Capernaum. That gets us back in our text here this morning, Mark chapter 2. Verse 1 says, and again, oh, I like it. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. Can I say this to you this morning? When Jesus Christ comes to town, there's going to be noise. Amen? Now, some of it's going to be good. Some of it's going to be bad. When Jesus Christ comes to town, it's going to be noised abroad. It's going to make a difference in people's lives. When Jesus comes into your heart, a change is going to occur. When Jesus Christ shows up and knocks on your door, the first thing that's going to rear its ugly head is going to be your flesh, your time, your personality, what you want in this life. That's what it is. The cares of this life, Jesus says. The cares of this world. It's going to rear its ugly head. Pastor Ellis used to always say it's like having two dogs inside of you. One good, one bad. One of the old man, one of the new man. And he said, you know, you know which one's going to win? The one you say, sick him, boy. The one you feed is the one that's going to win, my friend. So I want you to notice with me first thing this morning, I want you to notice that we see his presence. If we're going to get anything accomplished for God in this life, guys, we are going to have to have the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what's going to make a difference in the lives of those that are around you. That's what's going to make a difference in your life, the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John in chapter 5 and verse 20 says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, that we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. I requote again, which is not on the screen, John 14, 6. I am the way, the life, and the truth. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There are many churches out there meeting today, groups of people, congregations of souls that, that truly want to hear something of the Lord, but the Lord simply is not present there. James said, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. You want some control of God in your life? You want to get God in your heart? You want to get God in your life? You want to get him in your walk? You want to get him in your mind? The Bible says, draw nigh unto him, and he'll draw nigh unto you. Make the first move. Isaiah 55, 6 tells us, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Now, I emphasize that verse right there. I just hit that in my reading last week. But I emphasize that verse for this single point. In our mind today, in our convenient Google everything, everything, you know, information highway society we live in, we just, we have, we have in our brain, we fixed it out that everything revolves around our diary, don't we? If you message someone today, I'm, 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 other than my children, we're all, over the age of 40, 45, won't say who's further, but in who's middle ground, amen, I know where I am, <laughs> but we all remember the times of being at work, being at the office or wherever, and if somebody wanted to get in touch with you, what'd they do? Well, they either waited till you got home, amen, or they rang the house and left a message on that machine that had a tape player inside of it, and they left a message, and you called them back when you got home. Hey, David, how you doing? This is Brother BJ. Just giving you a call real quick. Hope all is going well. Hope you had a great day at work. When you get home today and have a convenient time, just give me a ring, okay? See you, bud. Talk to you soon. And if you don't know, this is what a phone does, not just the... Anyway, so 
But that's not so much today, is it? It isn't, is it? We send a message out, and we're sitting there going, it's been three seconds, no reply. Where are the bubbles? Where are the two checks? And again, I'm guilty. I get that. I get that. But we expect to have instantaneous answers for everything. We do. Our society has created us to become that way. Technology has created us to, come, to become that way. The, the insta, I mean, instant everything, instant coffee, which should be thrown out into the lake of fire and never come back into society, amen. Instant everything, all right? Good night, a microwave. There's no telling how, what the microwaves are doing to our bodies. But we don't want to wait for the oven to heat up and stick our food back in there to reheat it. We want to stick it in the nuclear machine because that's always worked out well, didn't it? Amen? I'm saying this, guys. We have created a mindset that we'll just go to the Lord whenever we want to. No, sir. That ain't what the Scripture says. The Bible says, uh, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. I got news for you. He's not working on your time. God ain't working on, in American slang, he's not working on your dime, he's working on his dime, amen? And if you want to get a hold of God in your life and you want presence of Jesus Christ in your life, you got to come to him while he's near, amen? When the Holy Spirit of God is touching your heart, when the Holy Spirit of God is pricking your soul, when there is an open sign of contrition in your days, that's when you come to God. Not when it's convenient to you. As a matter of fact, when it's convenient to you, it's probably the least time in the world. God's going to be near you. Let's just be honest, guys. There are times when the, the Lord's presence is felt. It's known. It's experienced. And there's times when it's not. If we get the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in this house, if we get the presence of, of the Lord Jesus Christ in our house, I promise you it's going to be noised abroad. It may stir up every devil that's in the back alleys and in the apartments and the, uh, the flats and terrace houses in our village. It may stir them up and they go, they go buck wild. And I tell you what, let them go buck wild, amen. Greater is he that is in you than is he that is in the world, amen. Paul tells us that we are more than conquerors to him that, uh, that, uh, that loves us, amen. I'm just here to tell you today, you get the presence of Jesus Christ in your life, there's going to be a difference. So number one, there's the presence. Number two. There's the preaching. Look in verse 2 with me. Mark chapter 2. It says, And straightway many were gathered together, and so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto him. Lord Jesus Christ gives the greatest example for the preacher, for the man of God. The greatest example for a man of God today is to preach the Word. And the preaching of the Word of God changes lives. Not a seven-step formula. Not a list of qualifications. Not a degree from seminary, or as Pastor Ellis said, cemetery. Somebody asked him, Didn't you go, did, you go to, did you go to seminary? He goes, yeah, I went to seminary, but I got over it, he said. Praise God. I'm not against education, guys, but I'm here to tell you right now, if you think you're going to formulate your way to make a life, make a change in people's lives, it's not going to work preaching the word of God to him. Jesus Christ did so in towns around. He did so here in Capernaum, coming back the second time. It's a preaching of the word of God that makes a difference in people's lives, both temporal and eternal. There's a tale that's told about the, uh, the great English actor, McCready, the actor, uh, McCready. And he, he, uh, an intimate preacher once said to him, he goes, I wish you would explain to me something. He says, well, what is that? He goes, I... I don't know that I can explain anything to a preacher, the actor said. He says, what is the difference between you and me? You are appearing before crowds night after night with fiction, and the crowds come wherever you go. I'm preaching the essential and unchangeable truth, and I'm not getting any crowd at all. And this is what McCready said. He goes, this is quite simple. I can tell you the difference between us. I present my fiction as though it were truth, and you present your truth as though it were fiction. My friend, the Word of God is truth, and there is no other truth than this right here. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't believe that, and if you don't believe every single word that is in this AV 1611 in this Bible, or if you believe there's a better one than this, people are not going to believe nor care what you have to say about it. I have one of the great, greatest questions ever asked to me yesterday. 
The guy said, it's a, this is a heavy, I asked God, I said, God, give me someone today to present the testimony to and a witness of faith to. This young man said, I got a question for you on this Saturday morning. I said, okay, go ahead. He goes, it's actually three questions. He goes, it's going to be quite heavy. He didn't know about my sons or anything like that. And he said, uh, number one, <clears throat> when do you get concerned over the situations going on in Russia with Russia and the Ukraine? Number two, he said, number two, he said, um, how do you handle the anxieties of what's going on in the Russia and Ukraine? And he said, number three, how does it challenge your faith? I said, good, that's, those are easy questions to answer. I said, number one, I got concerned, <clears throat> I got concerned over three years ago, nearly four years ago, when my oldest son joined the U.S. military. I said, I got concerned because he's deployed right now and could very well be faced on, facing on the front line of the battle. He, and I told him, I said, he's in the 82nd Airborne 3rd Battalion. I said, so I got concerned real quick, like in a hurry. Number two, there's not an anxiety to it. Because I know my faith in my God can keep my son as safe on the battlefield in Eastern Europe as he can in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And in all fairness, there might be some places in Eastern Europe that are safer than Fayetteville, North Carolina. And I said, thirdly, the answer of challenging my faith may be a challenge to it, but it doesn't move it. My faith is not in a leader of this nation. My faith is not in a, a, a queen or a king or a pr prime minister or a president. My faith is not in you. My faith is in an unchangeable truth in God. I am God. I change not. So it doesn't challenge my faith. And I tell you what, I thank God for that. Because the, man, the young man that asked me that question sat there in absolute, the look on his face, absolute unbelief. But not unbelief like, man, you're a crazy person. Unbelief of, wow, I want that faith. I want something like that. Unmovable. The Word of God is truth, my friend. And if you're going to present the Word of God to anybody in this world today, you've got to present it as truth and never move. Sink your heels in deep, stand firm, and don't move from the precious Word of God because that's what makes a difference in lives. If you've been changed by the Word, you'll stand on it. If you've been changed by a religion, this means nothing. This is nothing but dead letter. When there's the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in the house, when Christ comes to town preaching his word with authority in truth and not a tale of two cities, if you will, truth will prevail. Thirdly, today, notice with me in Capernaum the second time he went. After the Lord was present, there's preaching but we find people. We find people. Look in verses 2 and 3. And the Bible says, And straightway many were gathered uh, together insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of palsy, which was born uh, for. My friend, can I tell you this morning that there must be people in your life and listen, there was a purpose for Jesus Christ coming to this earth, and I was to seek and to save that which is lost. Oh, by the way, your modern version removes that verse right there, the purpose of Christ coming to this earth. Keep reading your NIV and your HIV and all that garbage, and you'll, you won't even find the purpose of Jesus Christ. It removes that he came to seek and to save that which is lost. Friend, we want revival in our land. We want revival in our South Wales. We want revival in our community, in our village today. We want revival in our homes, our workplaces, our church houses. Then we're going to have to understand that there's different types of people that came to this house that day in Capernaum, and there's different types of people that are going to come into your life every single day that Jesus Christ must be present to make a difference. You know what we find this day? We find the hungry this day. You guys have probably heard this before in the youth session. We find the hungry. Many of them didn't have meals to eat. And it's true. There were those present that day. They were hungry for something real. It was noised abroad that Jesus Christ was in the house and he had come to the town. And now, uh, listen, they came looking for something that was real. Something was sustenance. Something that would strengthen them. Something that would save them. My fear today is that our people are hungry for something real, but they're getting inoculated from something fake. 
There was people in this community that day that were hurting. Matthew eleven twenty eight tells me, Come unto me, all ye that uh, labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest, it says. Friend, there are people coming into church today, they are hurting. They're hurting from sin. They're hurting from shame. They're struggling with things that, that we have no idea about they're dealing with. You're going to see people every single day, seven days a week, that are hurting because they have committed sin in their life, and as a result, they have some type of sickness, whether it's physical or spiritual. They're struggling with things that we have no earthly idea of what is going on. And I'm going to say this. The last thing we need to do is to tell them how bad and how wrong and all that. They know how bad and how wrong they have done. In, uh, you know, in 2017, there was 23,000 self-help books on the topic of happiness available just on Amazon. 23,000 self-help books on happiness just on Amazon alone. Can I say this, guys? We have a society, we have a community, we have a village of people who are hurting. Whether it's from their own, their own reasons or someone else's reason, they are hurting. Amen. But we also have present this day, which you always will when Jesus Christ is around. you got the hungry and the hurting, but you got the hypercritical as well. The hypercritical. Look at verses 6 and 7. This is after Christ says, Son, I've sins be forgiven thee. In verse 5, verse 6 says, But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Boy, if they only knew. And, of course, we know this group. They're always in the crowd. They're always, they always, guys, listen, they always have a better way to do something, uh, which, in fact, they typically have a better way to do nothing, if we're honest with one another. You know, I'm going to say it like this. I like the way I'm doing something better than the way you're not doing something. Amen. So if you want to get busy for the Lord, get busy for the Lord. Do it the way you want to do it. Praise God. But make sure you stand on truth in doing it. Just like in Mark 138, I mean, 1, uh, 133, it says, And all the city were gathered together at the door. All the people came out within that multitude of people, and there were all sorts of the people. But guys, they all needed to hear the gospel. There were some in there. They were just hypercritical of what was being done. But there was others that wanted to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Finally, who we have show up this day, which really and truly is the central theme, I guess, of the, of the blessed event. We find the hopeless. Look in verse 3. It says, and there came unto him, or there came unto, sorry, and they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. Friend, here's a man who is a full-blown paralytic. He could not help himself. He could not do anything for himself. He was unable to feed himself. He was unable to dress himself. He was unable to bathe himself. He was unable to move himself. Things that we do every day without thinking twice. He could do nothing. Absolutely zero. 100% dependent upon those that were around him. We would have a world of people today. A community, a village of people today. Who in all fairness, guys, are 100% hopeless. They were without Jesus Christ in this world. They were without our Lord completely and totally hopeless in this life. And that was us once, once upon a time. That was you and I once upon a time. That was me on the morning of 31 December 1990, but that wasn't me on the evening of 31 December 1990. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13 says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus Ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Had it not been for Jesus Christ, for his presence, for his preaching, and for his people, we would still be today in this life without hope. But now we are in Christ Jesus. We are full of hope and glory in his name. So, beloved, today I ask you, how grateful and how thankful are you to be the one who was born of four. And we're going to dig deeper into him in the, in the upcoming weeks. 
But how thankful are you this morning to have been that one who could have done nothing for themselves and someone along the way, maybe four people, maybe one person, whatever it may have done, someone brought the precious gospel to you. And therefore, you were able to stand. Your sins, you were told that your sins be forgiven you. And you could stand in your own strength and go forward. You can block it out if you want to this morning. You can turn the page and you can think about what you're going to do this afternoon. But I'm going to tell you, it's going to look you in the face just like a mirror today. How grateful are you for the one who presented the precious gospel in your life? How thankful are you for that gospel that Jesus Christ and him alone could give you? The way that you're going to show your, your gratitude toward Christ, the only way you're going to show your gratitude toward what gift you've been given is to introduce him to someone else in this life today. To introduce someone to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You say, preacher, I don't know how to do it. How can I find someone? You're surrounded by people. Talk to them. But I'll tell you this, the best way to start this morning is to bow your heads and ask the Lord Jesus Christ to bring someone in your life to give you an opportunity to give you get to give your testimony of faith in Jesus Christ and him alone and stand upon the truth and quit making excuses for what you were told as a child or as an adult or whatever stand on the impregnable word of God today will you bow your heads this morning Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done and who and what you are. We ask you, dear God, that you take your message this morning, write it upon the table of our hearts. And Lord, we give you glory, honor, and praise and ask you to make a difference in our days, Lord. We pray, Father, that you would move in a mighty and wonderful way and lead us safely into a way that bring honor and glory and praise to thy name. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. I do hope and pray the sermon you just heard was a tender blessing to your heart and to your soul. I hope that it gives you the encouragement, edification to face the challenges that we see each and every day and week throughout our life. I'd like to invite you out to one of our live services here at Saren Chapel in Abraman. We are located on Lewis Street as well as Davis Street. Davis Street is the entrance to our chapel and as well as Lewis Street is the entrance to our hall and you can use either one of them. But secondly today, guys, I would like to share just a brief message to you now to ask you to where you are going in eternity. If today was the last day you were alive, if today by some tragedy, this is the last moment you had on this earth. When you closed your eyes, would you wake up and see Jesus Christ? It is a simple question, guys, and it is even a more simple answer. The Bible tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, paid the ultimate price for mankind. He gave us the free pass to eternal life by giving his life on the cross of Calvary, being buried into that grave, but rising again on the third day. It is simple as this. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You see, guys, while we were sinners, the Lord Jesus Christ loves us so much that he gave his life. As a matter of fact, Romans 5, 8 tells us, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Sin is defined as the transgression of God's law. But what happened was the payment with, for mankind is death. Romans 6, 23 clearly tells us, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So I ask you today, what would, what would stop you right here, right now, from bowing your head and saying a prayer much like this, Lord Jesus Christ, I trust in you. Jesus Christ, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, and I believe that you stepped up out of the grave to give us victory over sin and victory over death. I invite you into my heart and ask forgiveness of my sins and ask you to lead God and direct me throughout the rest of my life. Now, here's the thing. You say that prayer in your own words but you have to say it and believe in it remember romans 10 9 says and believe in thine heart that god hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved that is a promise from the word of god that is a promise from god himself that is the promise from the creator of all things that if you'll believe on jesus christ as your lord and savior today ask forgiveness of your sins accept his free gift and pardon of sin into your heart today that you will be born again that you will have eternal life in heaven. Guys, I hope and pray this is a blessing to you today. I hope and pray that you make that decision. And if you have, if you've made that decision today, let us rejoice with you. 
come by and see us here at the church or hit us up online at any of the social media outlets or through email or however you can. Just share with us the glorious transformation that you just received in your life. Guys, I hope to see you soon in the house of God. I hope to see you soon right here in Sharon Chapel. And may the Lord be with each and every one of you. God bless.